Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It looks like we've got most people on board. I'm sure there's going to be a few more join us as we uh, go through. Thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time um, and uh, having a chat with us today about some flight planning uh, issues. If you can, as we mentioned, keep your uh, microphones and uh, your videos muted as we go through. That's really going to help out. My name's Craig. I'm one of the CASA Aviation Safety Advisors. We're based all around Australia uh, and my home base is Perth. Uh, why are we here today? Well, these sort of online seminars and our in-person seminars give us the opportunity as aviators just to talk to each other, to swap ideas, to get information about what's happening out there in the aviation world. How are people getting themselves into trouble? What are the causes of some of the accidents and incidents that we're seeing? And what we can learn from those moving forward in our own uh, flight planning, in this case, practices. So. Flight planning will be the focus of today, and uh, in our online sessions, uh, it's a little bit more clunky to uh, hear from people with respect to questions and stuff like that. So it's a little bit more controlled than our in-person events, which we hold as well, but it's still a format that people have indicated they enjoy. It's a bit easy to get to the online uh, presentations. Uh, so we're still running them uh, after COVID, uh, and COVID was when we originally started these sessions. One thing I would like to point out to all the participants today is we will be recording the session and we record it so that we can put it up on the CASA website later for those who didn't have an opportunity to join us or perhaps there was a particular part of the presentation uh, that you wanted to go back and review. So flight planning is going to be our topic today and, and why did we pick flight planning? Well, we look at the ATSB, the Australian Transport Safety Bureau data, and we see what is actually happening out there. What are the important points we need to concentrate on as aviators if we want to reduce the accident incident rate? And the ATSB data is actually pretty clear. It shows that insufficient or ineffective flight planning is a causal factor in many of the fatal accidents and incidents that we, excuse me, that we see in general aviation uh, in this country. So we talk a lot when we talk about our safety um, processes and procedures and how we execute that in flight. We talk a lot about decision making. Pilot decision making is really important on technical skill, but the quality of those decisions we make in the air will be directly impacted by the quality of information that we base them on. So if we do effective flight planning, what that effectively means is when it comes to the in-flight decision making, the quality of information we have is going to result in better decisions when we talk about weather decisions, diversion decisions, et cetera. So it is a sad fact from the ATSB data that many of the fatal accidents we see were easily avoidable. Uh, and one way we as aviators can easily help minimise or, or, you know, sort of avoid accidents and incidents is to conduct proper and thorough flight planning. That really will help us out once we get into the air. So to help us today illustrate, uh, you know, how we can conduct proper flight planning and what the implications of poor flight planning are, we're going to be hearing some really good information and anecdotes from our speakers. Uh, we're also going to be looking at some case studies of what's actually happening out there. And based on that information, that'll give us good discussion points uh, that we can consider as pilots and hopefully uh, incorporate a few things into our, uh, you know, own safety practices. So we are going to be talking about case studies, just a couple of points on those. I know that the aviation industry is a small one and the community in Australia is a small one, and I'm certainly not here to cause any sort of embarrassment or distress to people. It's entirely possible that someone who is involved in our case studies or knows someone who is involved could be joining us today. Now, if that's the case, if you think the case study is going to cause you uh, sort of any distress, please feel free just to take a, a five minute coffee break, um, grab yourself a brew, relax and come back and join us when we finish talking about that case study. Another thing about the case studies is we don't look at them to point the finger of blame at the pilots or the crews involved. In most cases, they was, these were just pilots and crews like ourselves who were trying to do the right thing. Uh, and basically just uh, uh, had a little bit of lapse in concentration uh, and, and something's gone wrong as a result. So when we look at the case studies, we shouldn't be thinking, you know, that's never going to happen to me. I don't do that sort of thing. I follow the rules. We should be thinking that's a pilot just like me. 
it could happen to me if I'm not careful. And what can we learn from that incident to stop it happening to me? So ideally after today, I'm really hoping that every one of you takes away at least one or two points that you've thought back on and reflected on, on your flight planning procedures and, and thought, yeah, maybe, maybe I could do that a little bit better. Maybe a bit of complacency set in. Uh, maybe I'm a little bit rusty on that aspect of flight planning, or maybe I just haven't allowed myself enough time to conduct that aspect of my flight planning properly. And if we all walk away with at least one or two things where we can, you know, honestly and objectively say that maybe we could do that better and, and undertake to, to make that happen, uh, then we've achieved our objective today. So I'm going to just start a presentation um, first and, and we're going to look at a couple of case studies and then we'll move on to our other speakers and they're going to give you some really good information as well. We've had the uh, inevitable technical issues this morning, but I'm just going to get around that hopefully by um, demonstrating in a slightly different way my presentation and I'm just going to rely on Landy. If you can just let me know if you can see that one okay. Yes, Craig, confirm I can see that. Fantastic, thanks so much. So the aims of today, as we mentioned, it's to remind ourselves of the importance of good flight planning. We're going to remind ourselves of the implications of poor flight planning. That'll be pretty clearly demonstrated in our case studies. We'll look at accessing and interpreting weather forecasts, accessing and interpreting NOTAMs, and our outline flight planning aids and resources that both CASA, BOM and Air Services have available for you. But most importantly, if we can, as we go through all that, identify our own areas for improvement. And invariably, we will all have one, at least one or two. So it'd be great if we could identify that. So our presenters today, we've got uh, JP Davison Lamilla from Air Services Australia. We've got Wayne Ovens, and he's the Outback Air Race Flight Manager. Andrew Bonet Bomanis is a pilot and aviation theory lecturer, and he's presenting for us uh, today as well. And I'm going to kick things off with a couple of case studies. So our first case study when we're looking at flight planning uh, and how it can sometimes go wrong. Uh, this one involves a Cessna citation, uh, and this Cessna citation was planning to track to this airfield, uh, Gunnedah, and the uh, airstrip that it was planned to use based on the weather forecast was runway 0523. Now, in this case, we're looking specifically at NOTAMs as part of our pre-flight preparation. This pilot looked at the NOTAMs, looked at the weather, decided that the most likely runway was 0523 and went through all the NOTAMs and uh, had a look at the NOTAMs relevant to that. As uh, luck would have it, and as invariably happens in aviation, the uh, weather changed during flight and the runway that was actually used was 1836 because of a change in the wind. Now, the trouble with that is when the pilot was planning and concentrating on runway 0523, he sort of discarded a couple of NOTAMs that were actually relevant to the other runway because he wasn't planning to use the other runway. And unfortunately, one of those NOTAMs indicated that that runway was closed. Now, whenever we have a look at an incident like this, it's really difficult to point at one thing that caused the incident. Usually it's a layered effect and there's a couple of things, you know, why wasn't there adequate uh, runway marking on that runway, for example, to say it was closed. In this case, it wasn't quite up to standard. But in the end, what happened is the pilot had neglected the uh, NOTAM that said that runway was closed, subsequently forgotten about it during flight because of all the changes, et cetera, and the aircraft landed on that runway. Thankfully, in this case, there was no damage and the aircraft landed safely. So the work that was being done was not such that it impacted the aircraft's safety uh, and they managed to uh, get out of this one with no injuries and no damage to the aircraft. So it was a very lucky event. But it sort of just goes to show that uh, we can't just think, you know, because I'm trying to do the right thing, you know, nothing will happen to me. This pilot was doing the right thing. They were checking the NOTAMs. It's just that the process they used to discard the NOTAMs they thought were irrelevant was a bit faulty. Our second case study is a little bit more extreme, and unfortunately, this one has a, a quite a catastrophic outcome. It involves a, a Robinson R-22. Now, if you're a fixed-wing pilot, I, I don't want you thinking, oh, well, this is a helicopter incident. It's not uh, related to me. If we look at the aspects of a, what is a very complex incident, just from the perspective of the flight planning, 
you'll see that the decision making and the processes used are relevant across all forms of aviation, not just for the helicopters. So in this particular incident, uh, it occurred in 2016, April, as a pilot and one passenger, and they were joining with another R22, and they were going on a private fishing trip in North Queensland. If you're not familiar with the place names that I'm about to mention, don't worry, I've got a bit of a map there that shows you where this area is. Both pilots flying these choppers with a passenger on board as well were day VFR licensed only. And I want you to remember that as we go through this particular case study. The incident pilot and passenger depart a place called Mariba for Mossman, and they were meeting up with the other aircraft, the second aircraft at Mossman, before departing north for their fishing trip. They depart Mossman at 0800 local. So they tracked north to Cooktown for refuel and then further north to a place called Pippon Island and they were landing along the way and doing a little bit of fishing. So it just sounds like a, a fantastic day out. They took on drum fuel along the way. So there's our uh, map there. You can see Kansas down the bottom, the yellow pin. Mossman where the two aircraft met up, past Cape Trib, Cooktown for refuel and then up to Pippon Island which is not too far from Princess Charlotte Bay. On arrival at the island, the incident aircraft now has about 20 to 30 kilograms of fish, so it's obviously been a good day for fishing, uh, but they've got it in a non-standard container attached to the left skid, so they've effectively just uh, put a, uh, an esky, if you like, on the left skid. When we talk about pre-flight planning and preparation, weight and balance is obviously one of the things we need to do. It's very hard to do an accurate weight and balance if you fitted non-standard gear to the aircraft because there simply will be no data for it. So in this case, the uh, C of G of the aircraft uh, laterally um, was uh, considered not to be within limits, but it doesn't appear to have had a major impact on, on the incident. So after the day's fishing, the pilots depart the island separately between 1600 and 1700 local for Mossman. When we look at the pre-flight planning that was done for this particular flight, the pilots were using their GPS route info and just the local conditions they could observe where they were at that particular time to decide if they had sufficient fuel and daylight to reach Mossman. Now I think it's at this point I'd like everyone just to put yourselves in the position of these pilots. You're on the island, it's quite a long trip back to Mossman. Think about your legal responsibilities with respect to flight planning and what information you have to access and think about if you would be happy to proceed on that flight at that time of day, being a day VFR pilot, based simply on what your GPS route is telling you and what the weather is like where you are. There is no evidence that aviation forecasts were consulted for this flight. Simply put, that's in direct contravention of the rules. If we are doing a flight of that nature, we have to decide, or sorry, uh, consult a forecast, because really the local weather won't always reflect what we're going to see en route. During the return flight, the inevitable happened. The aircraft encountered squalls, headwinds, deteriorating weather, and they had to land at Cooktown to refuel. The incident aircraft was slower than the first R-22, which had a more experienced on pilot, uh, pilot on board as well, probably due to the extra drag of that uh, container they were storing the fish in. So when they got to Cooktown to refuel, the uh, receipts there showed that that refuel commenced, commenced at 1836. Again, I want you to remember that these are day VFR pilots flying aircraft that are only approved for day VFR flight. Last flight at Cooktown was 1838. Pre-flight planning with respect to weather, etc., should have included the time for last uh, daylight and therefore what time they had to be on the ground as day VFR pilots. That is the cockpit of an R-22. And if you have done any instrument flying, any of our instrument rated pilots of people who've done their basic instrument flying a part of their license training, I would like you to imagine yourself in poor visibility conditions with that instrumentation in front of you. And I think you'll agree that you're effectively blind. On ground at Cooktown, the incident pilot's passenger was actually nervous by this point about the weather and the lack of light and actually uh, questioned the pilot's intention to continue the flight. 
The incident pilot dismissed those concerns and both aircraft departed Cooktown at 18.40, two minutes after last light. Due to its high speed, the non-incident aircraft pulled ahead of the incident aircraft, but checked on the radio every 10 minutes or so how it was going. So I talked about a lack of pre-flight planning in this particular instance. This is what the pilot's plan was in this instance, and they discussed it between themselves. They were going to fly over water close to the coast, keeping the outline of the mountains as a visual reference. If bad conditions were encountered, and they never actually sort of articulated exactly what bad conditions meant, they would ensure that their altimeter was accurate relative to sea level and fly not below 250 feet AGL. Not only did they not say what bad conditions were, they were not really able to tell what they meant by or how they were going to ensure that that altimeter was accurate relative to sea level. And then if it got really bad, they would land on the beach. Now, for you joining us today, I'll get you to look at that plan and I'll get you to decide for yourself if that's a plan that you consider adequate for what was being attempted in this particular case. First 15 to 20 minutes of flight was relatively clear, but as the uh, light deteriorated, uh, the passenger of the incident aircraft reported one occasion of that helicopter descending close to the water before the pilot corrected. It got so dark that at one point the pilot dimmed the cockpit lights to reduce the glare off the windscreen of the helicopter to allow the pilot to see uh, a little bit better. This passenger who'd been worried back at Cooktown was still worried and he suggested landing on the beach, but the pilot did not respond. Shortly thereafter, the passenger saw the ocean more clearly, followed almost immediately by that massive bang and the helicopter impacted the water. That occurred at approximately 19.30 hours in almost uh, pitch black conditions. The passenger regained consciousness on the ocean floor, still strapped in, was able to release himself from the straps and float to the surface. The tide and waves were um, favourable at that time of night and he was carried into the beach and uh, rescued by people who were walking along the beach. The pilot's body was never found. And that was a picture of the wreckage on the ocean floor. So I think we can uh, sort of look at that incident and from a flight planning perspective, obviously there's a lot of other things like decision making, uh, you know, um, rules and, and following rules, et cetera, that come into it as well. But from a flight planning perspective, the pilots simply didn't have good information to base their decisions on. The accident occurred between Cape uh, Tribulation or just south of Cape Tribulation, uh, north of Mossman. So other factors that were seen in this accident, despite significant flight over water below 2,000 feet and outside force landing range, they wore no life jackets all day. So when we look at flight preparation uh, and planning, that also includes, you know, do we need extra equipment for where we're flying, such as life jackets, or if we're in a designated remote area? When the first aircraft, the non-incident aircraft pilot, was given the draft copy of the ATSB report after the accident, he still didn't think that the plan that they'd come up with was high risk or unrealistic. Uh, I think that's a very telling um, fact. So what were the ATSB findings? The pilot of the incident aircraft who was only qualified to operate in day VFR conditions departed on a night flight and continued towards the destination in deteriorating visibility until inadvertently allowing the helicopter to descend into the water. That's the facts. What we don't know, and this pilot's not here to explain to us, um, you know, why he did that, why he made those decisions, and why he didn't access uh, relevant information for that particular flight. So to make that process easier for you, we, we do put out a whole bunch of aids for our pilots to help them with their flight planning process. And if you're not familiar with these, head onto the CASA website. If you have trouble finding any of this stuff, just email myself. Uh, or any of the other aviation safety advisors around the countryside, and we can point you in the right direction. We can send you links. We've got the pilot safety hub. We've got the online store. We've got a bunch of pilot guides, which are in many cases location specific. We've got the VFRG. We've got a great YouTube channel with heaps of videos on safety related material, including flight planning. 
and we've got the Out and Back series, in fact, two of those series, which are really good little videos, uh, short videos with lots of good information on focusing on a whole range of issues, including uh, flight planning. So I really recommend those to you. That's the uh, face page for our pilot safety hub, and that's accessible via the uh, CASA uh, homepage. Bureau of Meteorology has some brilliant stuff on their website too. If you haven't got this in your favourites, uh, make sure you put in, I'll be putting the link to this page in the chats later in our presentation. So this is the Knowledge Centre for your Bureau of Meteorology, and it's you can see there a big list of uh, aids that we can use to decipher our meteorological forecasts. Uh, there's locational met, um, uh, features there, there's all sorts of good stuff there. So. Uh, when you get a chance, grab a cup of coffee and go and have a good look through the Knowledge Centre for the BOM website. So they're just some of the aids that we've um, uh, uh, basically come up with for you um, to help you uh, uh, with your flight planning. So at this point, what we'd like to do is just open up to a couple of questions now, not too many, before we move on to our next speaker. And just bear in mind that we will have a general question and answer session uh, towards the uh, end of the presentation. So are there any questions uh, for me at the moment before we move on? Okay, can't see any hands here. All right, well, in that case, we're going to move on now. And our next speaker is Andrew, Andrew Bowmanis. And so it's over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Greg, for the introduction. Just confirming that uh, the right screen is up, please. Looks good. Great. Okay. A um, little bit about myself. Uh, first of all, I've been involved in the aviation industry actively for over 35 years, uh, but I did go, my first solo was in 1969, many, many years earlier. I hold an ATPL and I've worked for the regional charter operators out of Perth for many years, but my main claim to fame has been aviation education. And over the years, I've had the pleasure of training many pilots, both at flight schools and also at university level. When Craig contacted me and asked me to give a presentation on flight planning, my first thought was, how many days of presentation am I given? What a huge topic. And I've given it quite a lot of thought and I've decided to talk about one small, but as you'll shortly see, very important topic in flight plan preparation. Who of us haven't heard about the five Ps? Now, for some reason, it's not uh, moving. Just give me one second. Uh, got a small technical glitch here for some reason, Craig. I seem to be jammed. No problem, mate. If um, if that seems to jam, what I can do is run it from uh, uh, my computer, and you can just tell me when to advance the slides. Let me know if you want that to happen. Ah, uh, yeah, that might work. I don't know why for some reason it's decided to go on strike on me. And uh, oh, here we go. We should be on the next slide now, correct? Can you just confirm? Confirmed. Great, thanks. Yep, no, just a uh, technical glitch here. So any of us that have learnt to fly, we have heard about the five Ps multiple times. Poor preparation prevents poor performance. How many times have we heard that or variations of that? So. My question is, when do we start our flight planning? So where do we go for that? Let's go to where the information is provided and it's in the AIP under on route 110, flight plan preparation. And I won't read it all, but it starts off with, before beginning of flight, a pilot in command. Pilot in command of what? The airliner traveling overseas, commercial operations, private pilot, or now even drones. And that instruction there applies to all of the above, plus anyone else at all that's going to go airborne. And it says, not maybe, but you must study the available information relevant to the operation. Um, the last case study, Craig went through, clearly uh, point A, current uh, weather reports, very, very important. And we can go through several of those. I want to go right down to point E. And uh, my presentation today is on the importance of NOTAMs. And it's quite clear what the AIP states. 
So what I want to do is I want to share an experience of mine. And I'm, I'm quite happy if I've made a blunder, but I can share it with other people and they say, oh, hang on. Uh, yeah, good point. Um, I'm quite happy to point out uh, where I erred on a particular trip. Now, as well as professional flying, I enjoy my private flying. And one of my favourite trips, uh, uh, sorry, I should have mentioned I am also based in Perth. One of my favourite trips is to fly to Rottnest Island on the, a weekend for lunch or perhaps a stroll around the island. Um, and for those of you who are not from Western Australia and not familiar with Rottnest Island, uh, I recommend that you put that flight on your bucket list. It's a short and very easy 15 minute flight from engine start at Janticott Airport to engine stop at uh, Rottnest Island in something like a 172. Now, this is a flight I've done many times. And every time I go through the flight planning requirements just as we've looked at. However, on this particular Sunday morning, oh, let's have a look at the flight first of all. So the flight from Janticott um, heads out over Fremantle Harbour, as you'll see shortly, a key point across to Rottnest Island. Anyway, this, there was a particular Sunday morning, I got a phone call from a couple of friends who said, uh, why don't we go to Rotto, as we call it here, why don't we go to Rotto for lunch? And it was a, a last minute decision, quick phone call, reserved me an aircraft and off I went to Janticott. The weather was 8.8 VMC, there was no wind. I've done this flight so many times before. So I didn't see any, any reason to go into Napes to check to see if there was anything there. Flight straightforward out of Janticott, across Fremantle Harbour to Rottnest Island. So as I was walking out to do a pre-flight, I bumped into a pilot friend of mine who asked me what I was up to and I said that I'm off to Rotto for lunch. Bit of a boast, uh, not really rubbing in the fact that he was hard at work as a flight instructor. And he paused and he said to me, have I read the NOTAMs? To which I replied, no, I haven't. And thinking to myself, weather's good. It's only a short flight going nowhere except to Rottnest. And it's pretty straightforward. Anyway, he strongly suggested I read the NOTAMs. Wouldn't tell me what they were, but suggest that I do. So, uh, excuse me a minute, that uh, went the wrong way. My apologies here, I just, uh, I'm very good at clicking the wrong button. So anyway, I went back into the flight school, I logged on into NAPES, had a look at the NOTAMs, and guess what I read? There was a NOTAM for Fremantle Harbour that the U United States Navy had three nuclear powered, nuclear armed warships docked in the harbour, and there was a three mile exclusion zone for any potential aircraft that was going to fly overhead. At worst, I could have been shot down. At best, I would have been in serious trouble with the relative authorities. A short, simple, straightforward flight I've done many times, but on this particular case, I didn't read my NOTAMs. Over subsequent years, when teaching for CPL and PPL uh, pilots, I would illustrate the importance of NOTAMs through my stupid slip up. And to this day, I am grateful to my fellow pilot on the tarmac who insisted that I check my NOTAMs. During one of my courses I taught at a later date, I had a student who then shared his experience. He was a farmer with a private pilot license and for his own personal um, satisfaction was upgrading to a commercial pilot license. His farm was substantial in size. He had his own aircraft, his own airstrip, and amongst the uses of his aircraft, he would fly the property at 500 feet above ground level to check on things like fences and cattle. And because he was only flying over his own property and far away from any town or aerodrome, and the weather looked good, he didn't bother going into NAPES. While taxiing out to, the, to do a property inspection, he saw an RAA aircraft fly past at very low level. That was followed by another and then another. So he thought, uh, 
not sure what's going on here and wisely he shut down and not decided to fly that morning. What was happening was that the RAAF were conducting low level long distance navigation exercises. I believe it's at around about 150 feet AGL. And the military conduct these low level navigation exercises at various airports, not just in Western Australia from RAAF Base Pierce, but uh, at all the uh, Air Force bases around the country. So should my farmer friend have known about this? After all, he's just going over his own property at 500 feet. Should he have known about it? The answer is yes, because the RAAF would have issued a NOTAM um, for that navigation exercise. And these are very precise. They will tell you exactly at what position they're gonna be and exactly at what time. His mistake, the same as mine, not reading NOTAMs. His thought process was, I'm just doing a farm inspection, uh, inspection so why should I bother reading the NOTAMs? Lesson learnt. So going back here, we can see there's a very important reason why the ARP says exactly what it does. So my take home message is regardless of what flight you're about to embark on, the proper preparation, hence the five P's, includes reading NOTAMs. Reading NOTAMs, the flight plan preparation goes hand in glove with the term airmanship and all of us have learned to fly. How many times has our instructor talked about airmanship? What is it and where does it start? And when I was preparing for this, I was having a look through some YouTube videos and I found a very good one which actually has a CASA link to it. And it's an interview with a whole um, group of Red Bull air racers when they were back in Perth some years ago. And there was one particular pilot who, as well as being an air bull air racer, was also a British Airways airline captain. And he was asked, what does airmanship mean to him? And when does it start? And he said for him, airmanship starts before he even leaves home. He said, it doesn't matter whether he's preparing for a Red Bull flight or getting ready to take a jet across the Atlantic. He would ask himself a lot of what if questions. And for him, that is where airmanship starts. What if the weather is doubtful? What if there's relevant NOTAMs to flight plan preparation? What if? What if? He states that you cannot ask yourself too many what if questions. The more you ask yourself, the more situations you will be prepared for. What if I hadn't read my NOTAMs as I didn't? and I hadn't bumped into the colleague on the tarmac that day. What if my farmer friend had taken off a few minutes earlier? And bad timing we have seen uh, all too often uh, resulting in serious um, accidents. Over the years of teaching pilots, I have always asked, who reads their NOTAMs before they go on a joy flight? The silence that I would often hear afterwards uh, tells me a lot. So from my experience and that of my farmer friends, the lesson is that before any flight, doesn't matter how many times you've done it before, part of your pre-flight preparation, your five P's is to read your NOTAMs. So practice the five P's and enjoy a safe flight. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Andrew. That was a, a great presentation. Um, thanks, Eric, for your question too in the chat there. Uh, we are going to address that particular question later in this presentation. So thanks very much for sending that one through. Uh, did anyone have any uh, questions for Andrew before we move on to our next presenter? Carsten, go ahead, unmute your microphone and um, let us know your question. Yeah, g'day. Can you hear me? Yes, mate. Cool. Just um, overhearing that one there, the fellow who was going to um, go for a fly off his property there and then those other three, I think it was Air Force planes coming over or whatever. I've got my own uh, strip up near between Bundaberg and Gladstone in Queensland. And every now and then there's one of those, are they Fanook helicopters there with the two sets of blades comes flying over at about 300 feet. And I, I'm not sure, but to find out 
if they're going to be in the area, for what aerodrome should I be looking up the NOTAMs to see if they are going to be? Because there's several aerodromes in my area. Yeah, look, it's a good question. It, activities like that won't always be associated with a NOTAM. Um, it, usually the low jet routes are because of the speed of the aircraft and, and they've got a fairly uh, fairly defined pre, pre-flight route. With respect to helicopter operations, you probably won't see a NOTAM unless it's going to be sort of a heavy area of helicopter operations, a particular concentration of them. So, look, my advice is I'm going to assume that your strip's not marked on the on the charts. Would that be would that be right? No, no, hmm. it's not marked. And um, what was the other thing I was going to say? And what frequency are they on as well? Are they on normal CTAF like one two six seven? It's a thing in my area, but are they monitoring that or are they, you know, that's the other thing. Okay, so in your area, is there any other airfields around? Not, um, look, there's a very small aircraft landing area, which is Agnes Water. Yep. But as far as aerodromes go, Bundaberg and Gladstone are roughly 40 to 50 nautical miles away each, one to the south, one to the north. Okay, so with respect to pre-flight preparation on that one, that's probably going to be a challenge because I doubt that that uh, aircraft activity would be no tammed. So you would be relying on just the outside air, uh, controlled airspace radio and CNBC procedures to avoid aircraft like that. Would they be on 1267? It's highly possible that they're on area frequency if they don't know that your strip's there. Um, but my advice would be to call uh, Ambly, where they operate out of, uh, and just establish comms with their operations centre. Let them know where your field is. Uh, sometimes they can avoid fields and sensitive areas if they know about them, but they could also tell you what frequency you expect to hear them on. Yeah. Okay. No worries. That sounds like a plan. Thank you. Thanks, Break, Carsten. Uh... Do you want to Thanks just mention the difference between um, perhaps area um, NOTAMs as compared to aerodrome specific NOTAMs? Would it be covered in an area NOTAM? Sorry, everybody. Uh, it, it, look, no, no, it's fine. Uh, it would depend on uh, how much activity is there. If it's an exercise that's going to be associated with, uh, you know, heavy uh, helicopter activity and JP, jump in if, um, if you uh, think I'm talking out of school here, uh, that might be associated with a NOTAM, but individual flights, probably not. Yeah, Craig, JP uh, here. I'm not sure who the gentleman was that raised the question, but it is a very valid uh, very valid question there. Uh, during my presentation later in the piece, I will be uh, going through uh, some different scenarios with respect to where we would issue no TAMs uh, across, uh, I guess, aerodynamic specific uh, FIR, uh, dual FIR and head office no TAMs. Um, as Craig has already alluded to, the, the dependency on the actual requirement to raise a no TAM uh, sits under the RKO, uh, I guess, requirements with respect to um, where they're operating in vicinity of a certified aerodrome and some other uh, determinations. But in this case, Depending where you are, if you are OCTA, um, you know, uh, just monitoring CTAF or local area frequencies out in that point, then normal VFR separation standards apply, and there's probably no requirement for a NOTAM. In saying that, though, uh, depending on where they're actually operating and the extent, and you know, if they're doing any vertical abrupt vertical manoeuvres, for instance, there is a likely chance that they, that an FIR NOTAM uh, that can be briefed on uh, the the relevant QNH or sub FIA area would be the best bet for you to pick up any, uh, I guess, military operating. Uh, uh, exercise in your area above your uncertified strip. Thanks, JP. Thanks for the information and thanks for the question, Carson. That was a good one. Um, we'll just move on at this point just for timing. If you still have a question, we'll try and get back to you at the end of the presentation. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce Wayne Ovens and uh, Wayne's going to give us a, a chat about some of the pre-flight preparation for the Outback Air Race. So over to you, Wayne, when you're ready. Morning, thanks, Craig, and thanks for the invite to uh, to participate in this uh, webinar. Um, just about to share my screen first. Should be that one. Should be sharing now. You got that? Yep, we got that, mate. Okay, right. Little background myself: pilot, forty years military and um, commercial pilot. I work uh, this National Jet Express as the head of training, flying we fly uh, Embraer one nineties, Q four hundreds, and one four sixes out of Perth and Adelaide around the place. Um, but in my uh, GA time, I uh, have a Glass Air 3, fly that, and occasionally fly a Vans RV-14, my hangar buddy. Part of those things has been uh, Outback Air Race. I first started those in 2015, then 2018. It was going to be 2021. Um, COVID got into the way of that, so it became 2022 Outback Air Race. That's what I'm talking about today, is uh, just how 
we had a challenge of moving this. The challenge was we ended up with 33 aircraft, started in Darwin, going through 10 airports, through three states and territories, ending up in Coffs Harbour. Into that mix, we had uh, two defence exercises, one of major, one of uh, Pitch Black in uh, Darwin. This was in August, September last year. Pitch Black was out of Darwin and uh, Tyndall, Catherine. And another one down on the east coast was the uh, Shoalwater Bay area. So that put a little bit of, uh, made a bit more planning there. So there's always um, a few things that are different with these ones in here. Wait for it to catch up with my click. All right. First thing we have the 33 aircraft, we had more than 33 pilots. We had quite a number of pilots there. A lot of them VFR, some IFR as well, mixed experience and all. Majority of all of them were using EFB of some sort with our planned NOS runway applications. The other variable there was the aircraft. 33 aircraft, have, it's just a little, have a look at the uh, variety we have, Cessnas, Pipers, Cirrus, and a couple of original ones, part Navy as a steerman. Most uh, biggest variable we're looking at there was the cruise airspeed, went between 95 knots up to 160 knots. Those of you who don't know about the Outback Air Race, it's a it's not a race as such, it's a time trial where it doesn't matter how fast or how slow you go. In fact, the, the overall winner of the entire race um, on points over the sectors was one of the slowest and was a, a Piper Cherokee at doing about 105 knots, 110 knots. So it's time trial based. Preparation, Andrew harped on that preparation and I agree totally with that. Preparation for an event of this starts well, well in advance, probably two to three, two years ahead of what we're having. Uh, I won't go through the preparation part for all of the logistical side of it, of trying to house 80 odd people and park 33 aeroplanes and find where we're going to park them and put things like that. My side of it was to do with the flying side, work out the airports that would fit with us, the route we're going to go between the two and check airspace to make sure that we are going to keep away from busy areas. Events, if we're going to go to one port and uh, suddenly there's someone else's planning a fly in there on the same weekend or the same day we're there, it gets a bit hard to get all the parking and accommodation gets hard. Pitchback 22 uh, closed. They had ex extensive areas of um, restricted airspace, temporary restricted airspace around all the way between Catherine and, and Darwin. Made it difficult for people to come into when they were arriving in Darwin. The uh, Shoalwater Bay area around Rockhampton is also a little area, mainly, mostly out over the coast and water, which we managed to avoid. To do so, preparation had to liaise with CASA, a lot of preparation with their services and the uh, the owners of all of the different airports that we went to. The other liaison there was the uh, Joint Rescue Coordination Centre. We didn't have 33 aircraft all putting their own flight plan in, running their own SAR times and things like that. We, as the uh, committee of the Outback Air Race Committee, ran our own SAR for the entire race, which meant we were the first respondent. If any of one of us managed to uh, let out of problems and had let off a PLB, that would go to the JRCC. They would contact us and we would be the first respondent for that area. That's the sort of liaison we had to do well in advance. Then we get down to our first departure and all the pre-flight planning which happened. We had some rest days where we had a day off just, just to relax and have some fun. But uh, pre-flight preparation, lots of it. Weather, it's always one of the first things you look at for both that departure weather, on route weather and the destination. How are we going to communicate where we are, what frequencies we're communicating for departure, how are we going to talk between aircraft or for en route and the destination communication. Coming back to NOTAMs and airspace, um, aside from the NOTAMs, and I'm sure I think JP is going to bring some more information about these as well. Um, associated with NOTAMs, early advance is coming ARP sucks, which tells you more of things coming in advance, which is how we find out the information about um, defence exercises when you're doing long range planning. And again, the uh, departure, if there's any airspace or no TAMs, if we have, uh, if they close the runway and you're not using that runway, it makes it a bit difficult to get 33 aircraft off. Big thing for planning also is to have contingency plans, alternates. 
we had 33 aircraft mainly going to a uh, to a single strip and uh, departing some of them were quite some distance between others and this if the first aircraft landed and had an unfortunate landing incident where he blocked the runway there's 32 other airplane all in close coordination coming in behind them so we have to have we had to have plans on what would happen um, luckily we managed to keep it very safe and we didn't have to uh, implement any of these contingency plans the whole thing about it is if you prepare for the worst and hope for the best on route planning all of the pilots there and the crews they had to do their own planning as well to work out a time on target to manage their times and to plan around airspace uh, generally i i as, a, as the uh, traffic uh, the flight manager gave them some good instructions on or some instructions hopefully it was a uh, good on how to avoid controlled airspace the last thing we want is have people getting uh, an infringement on airspace traffic I have a quick chat about ADSB in out. We had um, on first air race, there was very few in 2015. There was a, the occasional one had ADSB, it was just new. 2018, we had 10 out of the 30 odd um, aircraft had ADSB out. This time, out of 33 aircraft, we had nearly 30 of those had ADSB out, and probably eight or nine of them had ADSB in as well. So it made it very easy to, uh, to keep a, a God's eye view on what was happening. The EFB apps, when you have um, airspace, uh, when you have um, connectivity, also give you some traffic information, which is also handy. That's all the pre-flight planning. Generally, every morning I used to give a brief um, for or the, pre the previous night before or in the morning for the weather brief and what to expect for the departure en route and arrival. Briefings, left hand, the old way. Is that where we're going or is that where we are? Can't remember. And now everyone here stands around with their EFBs and their iPads and saying, I can't get the internet. Anyone who's downloading stuff? The biggest problem we have with the EFBs, uh, some places, is access to internet. And heaven help us if someone has a, an iPad, an iOS update that has to happen and that hogs all the internet for the next 20 minutes while everyone's trying to download the weather. So group briefings is takes about the questions, no such thing as silly questions in a briefing. So we went through the briefings in the morning and uh, we had it all covered. The biggest part about the briefings for these is our departure. Departures, always fun. There's only 10 aircraft in that line. That's the way we could do our departure, which probably wasn't such a good idea when you're trying to run, trying to beat each one of them off. And then you have 33 airplanes all chasing themselves down the place. Remember, we did have a massive uh, airspeed differential between the slowest and the fastest. So how did I plan it? Once again, planning. Majority, in fact, all of our cases, we didn't work out of Darwin Airport and main, the primary airport. We worked at um, MKT. For those of you who know Darwin area, it's about five, 10 k south of um, Darwin Airport. And best, the good thing about it is it's outside the controlled airspace veil. So we can depart into controlled airspace and remain outside controlled airspace. For all of our other ports, we managed to avoid controlled airspace. At a three minute interval, 33 aircraft every three minutes works out 99 minutes. Plus we had other aircraft coming in and leaving. So it worked out about two hours of fairly intense activity to get people out there. Um, that's the planning side of it. Plan the departure, the slot departure time. It's very hard when you have GA aircraft. Okay, when you, uh, if you're used to flying, you, um, most people, they wake up, oh, God, lovely day, go flying, go down to the hangar, check our NOTAMs, check our weather, get in the airplane and go. You don't have to wait for someone else. You don't have to make your timing. This one here, everyone said, oh, I want to go in the morning. I want to go late. I want to sleep in. No, I had to go when I told them to go. It took a little bit of planning. The weather can affect how you depart. If the weather's uh, cloudy, we had one place where we had to delay departure by an hour to wait for the rain to come through. Runway access, if you have to backtrack, considerations for all of these things on, on, on the planning. And then finally, airspace. Very few places where we went between um, Outback Queensland, there's not much controlled airspace or danger areas. So how did the departure go? This is a screenshot 
fairly well lined up, going from uh, Barumba to Adele's Grove. That stage in there, no, not at Adele's Grove. We're going there. On, we're in end up there. We're going to shoot Harbour at that stage. We just come from Karumba, from Adele's Grove. So we're going from uh, Karumba down to we're ending up on the coast at Shoot Harbour. We had a refuel stop at Yundan, which is where that one aircraft pointing north is in the centre. Some of them had a direct line; they didn't have to refuel, but they're fairly well spread out, and we managed to avoid each other. Once again, very little controlled airspace there. So how do we manage controlled airspace? Planning. One of our routes was between Chute Harbour and Gladstone. And if we'd taken a straight and direct line, we would have gone through Rocky and Mackay. All that controlled airspace. And you see there's a little red area just to the north of Mackay, sorry, north of uh, Rocky. That's the, uh, the Shoalwater Bay restricted area that was active at the time. So the pink line is the direct line between two, two points. Green line is where we managed to avoid all the areas and we track inland. Not quite so scenic as tracking coastal, but still quite good. So the whole thing about that one is, is preparation, working out, knowing where the controlled airspace is and then working out where you're going to. All in all, it was a, a great two weeks. Lots of people had a great lot of time. We had no Incidents or accidents, had a few uh, breakdowns, flat tyres and certain pieces. Lessons we learned out of it. Preparation works. You know what's going on, makes it simple. Um, we got very lucky. You can't control the weather. This stage here, because we had accommodation booked the day in advance, the day after and things like that, if we had one delay, one out one day's delay, the ripple effect of uh, losing, um, finding accommodation for an extra day and then losing accommodation downstream made it very difficult. So we had to pretty much run ourselves on the schedule as much as we could. Couldn't control the weather, but we got very lucky, managed to arrive between the rest of them. Always have a plan B, not as in uh, Craig's preparation, plan B, land on the beach at night, not quite that bad. Have a plan B, we have alternates, where to go if something did go wrong. Finding out all this information of where you're going to go is the important thing. For us, the access with our lowly EFBs and Telstra access, we had there's very few areas in the very, very top end of Queensland where we had no access. Everything else you can get. Anything you know, as soon as you get to two or three thousand feet, you have internet access, which is wonderful for keeping an eye out on weather ahead of you and things like that. So that's having that at your fingertips and uh, that it works. Get your preparation on the ground. Last thing you want to do is be having your head inside, looking at a at a ten inch screen when there's this big big window outside when you look outside. That's the gotcha about EFBs. They are magnets to suck you into them. The other thing I touched on also there is ADS-B in and out. It's a game changer. It helps air traffic control. You have many guys you'll find, you they know where you are, which is a good thing. Um, you know where other people is if you have ADS-B in. You know their call sign, you know their, their closing rate to move, all of those. It's just so good. And I would recommend to you take advantage of the uh, of the CASA in, uh, and, and their services um, uh, contribution, co-contribution, if you want to update your uh, your hardware. It's probably worth doing. And aside from that, we just had a great time and we just and uh, we've got another one running in another three years. Be oversubscribed over once again. Um, there's my uh, well, the next race 25. Didn't take it in this last one. My daily ride on the right. Thanks for having me and if any questions come right in. Thanks, uh, Wayne and Siri, for that presentation. That was really good, particularly um, like the focus on planning for the expected, but also have a plan in place for the unexpected as well, which will invariably happen, invariably happen in aviation. So fantastic. Thanks so much for that, mate. Uh, would it, does anyone have a question for Wayne before we move on? Carsten, go ahead, mate. Should be online. Yeah, thank you. Sorry to hold the question things. Um, I think the gentleman just before said that 
with the EFB, he gets good signal, uh, Telstra or whatever, from two or 3,000 feet. But I find actually I get less signal the higher I go, and I go with Optus, I go with Telstra, with experimental aircraft. I've even put a, a 4G antenna at the bottom of the plane, stuff like that, just to try things. And um, the reason I ask is because being reliant on certain information, such as uh, restricted areas being active on the likes of Oz runways, I've had two devices on board, one showing an area as being active, and the other device showing it being inactive. And they only obviously are up to date if you've got signal. So I was just curious about what the gentleman mentioned, if that's correct, did I hear that correct about getting better signal the higher up you are? It, uh, it does depend upon how high you go, because uh, in my daily ride up at um, 35,000 feet, there's not much in the way of signal at all. Uh, mm. There is a, a sweet spot. No, that's cool. No worries. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for that, Carsten. A point I'd make there also, as Wayne highlighted, planning for the unexpected. There's a few things that can go wrong with your EFBs. Obviously, connectivity is one of them, uh, but we have had incidents of them just shutting down, particularly in the heat. Uh, so if they get hot, they'll just shut down. So always worth asking with EFBs. If you're a private pilot, you're not legally obliged to have a backup source of information on board, but we recommend you do in the form of a, a paper map, et cetera. So always have a plan B. What will I do if this thing fails for any reason? So good question. Thanks for that. Okay, well, now we're going to um, move on to our next our, and final speaker, uh, JP from Air Services. So uh, over to you, JP. Thanks, Craig. I'll just uh, start sharing my screen. Just let us know when you can see that one. Yep, we can see that now, mate. Perfect. Stand by. Great. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, including Andrew and uh, Wayne, for your scenarios. Um, and thank you, Craig, for the introduction and the opportunity to discuss the importance and benefits of pre-flight briefing. It's my absolute pleasure to be able to showcase uh, both NAPES, uh, its functionality, and to also promote the efficient and timely uh, and correct briefing as part of a pre-flight briefing requirements. Uh, obviously, reading through the chat, I understand there are frustrations before we actually kick off with the amount of NOTAMs that are obviously populate into the system. Um, before I actually kick off, I want to uh, raise your attention to the actual work that we are doing both on the ground and with CASA to try to, um, I guess, refine what's re required to be NOTAMed uh, and also working with external originators as well. So it's not just uh, the NOTAM office that are included in that process. It's also a number of of external uh, bodies, including uh, CASA, reporting officers, the military, et cetera. And everyone has a different understanding of what's actually safety, uh, what's actually required from a safety perspective. Um, so again, just keep that in mind as we go through today. Uh, also another disclaimer, uh, some of the content that we'll cover today might be uh, quite, um, I guess, extensive uh, for some of you, uh, but I think it's important for us to cover it with uh, the understanding of that we're trying to just upskill those to, to uh, individuals, airspace users, to, to, to know where to go to obtain a correct and complete uh, briefing prior to flight. A little bit about me, I started with Air Services back in 2011 and I actually started as uh, in, in the role uh, known as an Air Traffic Management Information Specialist. Uh, I gained my qualifications in both the briefing and NOTEM office and I have no doubt that I've probably spoken to a number of you uh, on, on the, on the uh, webinar today. So welcome and hopefully uh, the interactions we have had in the past uh, were, were good ones. I am privileged to be able to present today and hope that you'll walk away from the presentation with an increased understanding of how no terms are issued, including how you can navigate the system to ensure you obtain all required information prior to taking to the skies. So let's just move on to what we're actually looking to cover today. Um, Again, through the chat, I understand majority of you are probably aware of uh, NAPE's system itself, uh, including the app that's actually not owned by us, but um, what we'll cover is just getting into a bit of the nitty gritty on what actually NAPE's is, um, how we can actually navigate the system, uh, including how to register if you haven't actually done so already, uh, including uh, how far in advance you can actually obtain your pre-flight briefing. Uh, we're looking at that 14-day uh, window of opportunity there uh, to make sure that you are, you are reading your uh, re required NOTAMs and information prior to departure. 
We'll also then switch to how to search for FI no temps. And again, trying to look at how we can refine and uh, I guess disregard the information that's not relevant for your stage of flight or you know point to point access. We'll also look at the decision for putting a no tem on uh, the FIR, the aerodrome or head office, uh, following on from the gentleman's comments with respect to uh, his strip being, uh, I guess, located a, a, a far distance away from a certified aerodrome. We'll also want to touch on uh, if you can and can't no TEM on uncertified aerodromes. And I want to take a viewpoint on that one, uh, knowing that the majority of people on the call today uh, are more than likely GA pilots, uh, RPT pilots, etc. Um, yeah, and, and again, that understanding that it, there are uh, information issued against uncertified strips, you know, whilst it might be OCTA, it's inf always important to make sure that you're doing a complete briefing. And the last two points there is just going to address uh, AIP SUPs and trigger no temps. You know, what are they? How do you find them? And why check them? And the same goes for the trigger no temps there. And then finally, we're just going to have uh, a quick reference or resource page with what we're actually covered uh, through today. All right, so let's get let's get started. So first and foremost, what is NAPES? Uh, for those of you that have navigated the system, uh, again, another acronym that we love in aviation, but the National Aeronautical Information Processing System, and it provides a central database of meteorological, no term and chart information. Uh, the system is used by us at Air Services to provide pre-flight and in-flight briefings and to accept and distribute flight notifications, including no terms for the in, uh, entire Australian FIR. Uh, for your awareness, NAPES is actually connected to what we call the Australian Fixed Telecommunication Network, the AFTN, with a direct feed with the Bureau of Meteorology uh, and also providing the aviation community with real-time information, including up-to-date weather information for every stage of flight. So again, that's direct link with uh, our, our other stakeholders ensures that the information that you are obtaining prior to your flight is up-to-date and real-time. Access to the link, as you can see there, is provided and it's available on the NAPES homepage. Um, and I definitely encourage all of you to, if you haven't already, uh, to navigate to that link, uh, jump in um, and and ha have, have a go at accessing it. So let's take a quick look how you can actually log in and register for NAPES before looking at uh, how we can actually navigate the system. So for those that have used the, the NAPES system uh, previously, you'd be very familiar with this page, um, including how to access, register and log in. If you actually haven't uh, registered, it's simple. You know, once you navigate to the actual link, you can just click on the register page. You'll fill in uh, a bunch of uh, forms, details, including your name, contact number, uh, valid email address, etc. Doesn't take more than a couple of minutes to actually register and then uh, away you go. Um, just want to highlight here that the NAPES internet services is fully supported by our services and offers a H24 support through the briefing and OTAM office. So again, if you've got any questions with respect to both logging in, registering, or even just a general question of, about no TAM briefing, please feel free to reach out to us at any time. We are staffed H24 uh, Monday through Sunday, so seven days a week. Uh, some of you, uh, which you have raised and commented already, um, may be using other third party providers such as Oz Runways, Avplan and Champagne Services, who also offer a similar service obtaining their data via direct interface with NAPES. So whilst you might be using uh, these, these third party, party providers rather, uh, understanding that that information is uh, drawn directly from, from NAPES with our direct feeds with the Bureau and the like. Again, access to the platform is easy and hassle free. All you have to do is register for an account and away you go. All right, so moving, moving on. Again, these two forms are probably, um, yeah, I guess, drop down menus that we are familiar with uh, for, for the people that are in attendance today. So once successfully logged into NIS, users can navigate to the displayed briefing menus in order to obtain a thorough pre-flight briefing. Both the location briefing uh, tab on the left and the area briefing on the, sorry, the location briefing on the right and the area briefing on the left. Um, both uh, will provide you with all required options to obtain uh, en route, location specific, weather and note information for your upcoming flight. Whilst we're on the topic of obtaining your briefings, I just wanted to raise or take a moment here to remind everyone of the improved capability changes that were actually made last year uh, in September. And that was a system change to align um, the ability to conduct pre-flight briefings up to 14 days in advance. Understanding both uh, Wayne and Andrew touched on the importance of briefing uh, you know, well and truly in advance. Um, the reason for this, uh, 
in terms of uh, pushing out that window. So previously, more majority of you would probably remember that you could only access a briefing up to 10 days in advance. That change actually aligned the process to, to brief up to 14 days in advance. And the reason for that was actually an, a, an alignment with uh, the RKO standards. So again, we're, we're I guess, regulated service. Um, you know, we operate under a number of RKO um, authorities, et cetera. And the reason, the main reason for the 14-day uh, advance notification or ability to view those NOTAMs was to better align the, with the requirements stipulated in the MOS 139, which is what reporting officers at certified locations around the country uh, need to abide by. So, for instance, in those uh, lo locations, they were issuing, you know, runway works NOTAMs, uh, you know, two weeks out, but NAPES was actually only displaying that information up to 10 days out. So there's a period of four days that whilst the NOTAM was published, it wasn't visible. So we increased our system parameters uh, to allow visibility of, of those NOTAMs up to and including 14 days. And that, uh, again, allows uh, everyone on the call today and the airspace users to have a much longer lead in time to start planning their trip effectively. So notwithstanding the change and whilst the functionality to brief out to 14 days in advance is possible, again, I encourage all uh, or everyone on the call today to conduct pre-flight briefings on a regular basis leading up to and also including the day of operations to ensure all changes are captured. Okay, so moving right along. So the first part I want to discuss here is um, you know, now that we've covered the more basic functions of the system, including how to log in and navigate to the correct menus, I want to shift our focus here to some of the more commonly asked questions regarding NOTAM issuance and how you can actually refine your briefings and not, so to not include unwanted information. So, you know, what's an effective way to search uh, for FIR NOTAMs? Uh, going back onto the feed, I understand uh, the frustrations. You know, there's a lot of information out there. And again, we are working uh, with our stakeholders, et cetera, to try to refine the amount of NOTAMs that are out. Uh, and I, uh, you know, I, I ask for your patience while we work through those those processes. So again, so a location briefing will provide all MET and NOTAM information for selected locations, including the ability for pilots to refine their search based on their operations. For those of you that have used in the past, the, the use of a seven series sub FIR code can also be entered through the location briefing drop down menu to retrieve required NOTAM and MET information. For example, you know, if you're operating out of uh, Brisbane for the Sunshine Coast and solely operating within Area 40, you're not going to be operating to Area 20 or further up the actual coast towards Cairns, etc. Um, you, you can simply put or input 7400 um, YBBN, so the Yankee code for Brisbane, uh, YBSU for the Sunshine Coast and also YSHO for your head office NOTAMs in the location briefing tab and uh, that will uh, retrieve or return a complete briefing for your operations uh, making sure that you obviously include your med information as well. Now, if you do obviously just refine, again, it's an understanding of what you can actually input into those fields, because once you get a better understanding of how to actually navigate the actual system, the drop downs, it will reduce the amount of FI no attempts that an airspace user has to filter through while also providing vital and relevant information for their operations. I want to raise uh, your attention now to uh, for those interested, you know, in, for more information on how to navigate NAPES, including how to further refine briefing packages, the URSA Gen pre-flight uh, actually has a complete list of all valid codes, including detailed information regarding the use of AVFAX. For those seeking more information, I definitely encourage uh, everyone on the call today, uh, if you're not already familiar with the URSA Gen pre-flight, just to uh, duck onto the document, have a, have a quick read and see if there's anything that you can actually apply uh, with respect to your operations to, to further refine your operations. To, to remove those pages and pages of FIR no TAMs and, and potentially some other locations that aren't required. Whilst we're on the topic, I also wanted to, thanks Craig for putting that one on there. Um, I also wanted to raise the awareness uh, last September, Air Services issued an ARC uh, with respect or to raise notification to what's going to be notified or referred to as the pre-flight information and flight planning manual. Now that manual will actually be released on the 23rd of March this year and be uh, a pilot's one-stop shop for all planning requirements and will actually replace the Ursagen pre-flight section in its entirety. So again, Familiar, familiarize yourself with the OSA Gen pre-flight. Um, and then obviously from the 23rd of March, that will be replaced with the pre-flight information and flight planning manual. The reason for that is to obviously, like I said, try to improve the functionality and the briefing experience for those uh, pilots, um, you know, trying to minimize the amount of documentation they've obviously got to refer to prior to operating. Perfect. Okay. 
And going back to what I said, we we're going to discuss. So again, understanding that the NOTAM office is a regulated service and we have a, a few considerations to, to work through with external stakeholders when considering uh, where we should actually raise a NOTAM. So some of you might be thinking, how is the decision for putting a NOTAM on the FIR or an aerodrome determined? You know, whilst the responsibility to issue a NOTAM sits with the responsible originator, whether that be military, a pilot, a reporting officer at Brisbane Airport, um, I thought I'd provide a quick explanation so to support airspace users in their understanding of what to expect when briefing on various locations. So let's start by looking at the requirements to raise a NOTAM on an aerodrome for that, for that matter. Uh, whether it's, in this case, we're going to look at a certified aerodrome. Uh, a NOTAM will be issued on an aerodrome if it's about a facility, event or a hazard that has a direct effect on aerodrome operations and that is generally within five miles of an aerodrome with an, with, with an actual NOTAM service. And that's both on the ground or within the airspace associated with that aerodrome. So going back to uh, the gentleman's comment earlier, if you are in the vicinity and within five miles of an aerodrome, uh, anything from a hazard perspective, you should be able to pick up in a location specific briefing. Uh, and that's done uh, just putting in the actual relevant Yankee code into your briefing tab. If it's not covered on a location briefing or the NOTAM office will also consider issuing against a single FIR, whether it be Melbourne or Brisbane, if the hazard is occurring more than five miles from an aerodrome or the hazard for which the aerodrome NOTAM has already been issued, but the hazard extends to a height or distance from the aerodrome, which may affect pilots overhead or nearby, uh, and but not necessarily using the aerodrome. So again, five miles for the actual location to speak of NOTAM, anything outside of five miles or potentially going to affect overflying aircraft, that information should be compiled and, and obtained through a, a NFIR briefing. So again, Quickly summarising this, you can start to see or understand, hopefully, the reason for the amount of NOTAMs that are actually published. It's in trying to capture um, the right audience with, with respect to, to, I guess, the operations, um, whether or not they're local flights, OCTA, or actually going to controlled airspace, or also just you know, simply notifying pilots of air, air navx or military exercise, uh, low-level flights with some uh, military choppers, et cetera. The last one there is the consideration uh, whether or not we actually need to put it on to what we call a dual FIR no 10. So again, location specific, single FIR or a dual FIR no 10. So in the event that it has it actually requires further distribution, uh, then the, the NOTAM office and the, through the coordination with our stakeholders will consider a dual FIR NOTAM if the conditions for an, uh, for an FIR NOTAM are fulfilled. For those of you that aren't aware of what a dual FIR NOTAM are, so that's a YMMM, YMMB NOTAM, um, they are rare, uh, but they do occur, especially for uh, exercises or hazards that occur along the FIR boundary line. So as you all uh, should be aware, the FIR extends from the northern west uh, corner of the country uh, and cuts through the middle of Australia all the way down to the southeast uh, corner. Now, depending on uh, exercises, uh, large operations that's, that do operate in those sub-FIR areas, if the area of, of or the hazard extends over both FIRs, then we will consider uh, raising on uh, what we call the dual FIR no 10, as long as the affected QNH areas are, are shared by the, by the FIR boundary line. Thanks, Martin. Appreciate your time. Okay, and the lastly, uh, the last one that we all probably forget to include in our briefings here is the uh, is the consideration of a head office no ten. Now, what we've just covered: location, FIR no tems, dual FIR no tems, and our head office. You know, if a hazard or request refers to a procedure, a rule, or an update relevant to all pilots in Australian airspace, then we'll consider the actual issuance of what we call a head office no tem, or what we refer to as YSHO. YSHO. Whilst on the subject of head office no tems, uh, I'd like to remind you that head office no tems should and must always form part of your pre-flight briefings, uh, and you can do that by including YSHO uh, under the location briefing tab, or the inclusion of what we call nine, what what is nine thousand in the area briefing tab to ensure a complete and accurate uh, pre-flight briefing. So let's summarise because I understand that there's a lot of content there. Um, probably mag magnifying the fact uh, of the amount of information or areas that one must consider, especially prior to departing. Uh, there's there's a lot of uh, 
areas that, that one should consider before obviously operating. So let's, let's summarise it if we can here. So no attempts will be issued against the following locations, either under the Yankee code for an aerodrome, under the FIR or dual FIR, and as head office if neither of these options apply. So again, when operating, pilot and airspace users are reminded to brief on all of these locations, including retrieval of med information to satisfy all pre-flight uh, requirements. Okay, so now that we've covered uh, how to obtain an accurate and complete briefing, the one thing I do want to consider and raise here, understanding that again that we've got a large GA audience on, on the line, is are there any considerations for in determining whether or not to brief on an uncertified aerodrome? You know, this question has become uh, more frequent in recent years, especially as the GA community continues to grow and expand, which is great to see. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the last few months uh, with CASRA regulator, uh, and we have determined that there, there are opportunities available to make sure that we, in certain instances, we allow uh, no attempts to be raised against uncertified aerodromes. Uh, whilst the majority of no attempts are issued against certified locations, a no attempt service is provided for uncertified locations. And I'll show you uh, just for your awareness of what those circumstances might be in the next slide. So just to spend a little bit of time here, um, what you can see on the left hand side is what we would refer to as the subject or the reason why a, a no attempt would be considered uh, to be issued against an uncertified location. So, for instance, if it is an aerodrome specific hazard or facility, uh, we would consider raising an OTM on an certified location if it was a certification change or a notification to a closure, for instance, and CASA would be the arbiter or the responsible entity uh, to raise that OTM. Other instances that we would potentially consider, uh, taking into consideration hazards uh, and any general safety implications, aerial works, uh, communication failures, lighting facilities that uh, require updating, for instance, the pilot activated lighting, uh, and a couple other notifications, as you can see there. Now, this table, uh, for your awareness, isn't currently readily available uh, to the pilot and industry. It actually referred to uh, one of our data quality requirement documents uh, for no TEM originators, but it will also be included in the pre-flight planning manual for release in March, and, and that's gonna be available to all of you on the actual call today. Okay, so we've covered the MET no time requirement for pre-flight, but what about ARP documents? Is there anything else that needs to be considered prior to starting up? What about ARP SUPs or ARCs? What are they? How do you find them and why check them? Um, again, more information that needs to be read uh, and hopefully with what I'm able to provide you, uh, it's a little bit more of an understanding of why they're issued and how you can actually uh, obtain them uh, a lot easier going forward. So for those unfamiliar with ARP documents, ARP subs publish temporary changes of long duration. So that's generally three months or longer, including information of short duration that contain extensive text and or graphics. And these supplement the permanent information that's contained in the Australian ARP. So ARP subs uh, are used to provide critical information regarding airport works, military exercises, major events that we've discussed today, uh, whether that's to an aerodrome or a larger area, newer revised procedures or other safety critical information. Now, while SUPs are generally issued against a specific aerodrome or area, some events, as we've discussed today, uh, including military exercises, actually cover significantly large areas of airspace, especially in, uh, well, more frequently rather, in New South Wales, Queensland and Northern Territory, and will be outlined in the ARP SUP. For example, the Talisman Sabre military exercise and other exercises that regularly take place on the East Coast and extend up to the Northern Territory. Where possible, an ARP SUP will be issued with at least 28 days notice. However, due to operational requirements, and potentially uh, in some cases a uh, late notice, they can be issued with immediate effect depending on the extent of the operation and the notice period received. Again, reinforcing the requirement to always update briefing packs and ensure briefings are conducted during all stages of pre-flight, including the day of ops. The last bit and the reason for the inclusion of the email there was that there is there is the ability, and if you would like to be notified of all SUPs, in, instead of navigating through the Air Services website, you can actually send or email us uh, at the email address there to be included on the notification list of when any new AIC or AIP SUPs uh, go live in the system. So it's just another tool there uh, for all of you to be notified as quickly and accurately as possible. Okay. 
understand that not all of you want to probably be on that distribution list and that's completely fine uh, but if you don't want to set up automatic notification via email there are other, other mechanisms available in order to be notified of new ap subs and they come in the form of uh, what we are all or should be, all be aware of at uh, trigger note terms and again should form part of your pre-flight briefings so what actually is a trigger note term? What are they for and how long are they in effect? To put it simply, trigger note terms are issued when a new or replacement SUP or ISC is published. They become effective at the same date time as the AIP SUP or ARC and remain current for the duration of the SUP to a maximum of 14 days. So that is, for instance, if we were to issue a SUP with an effective date covering the 1st to the 3rd of March, then obviously the trigger note term would marry up with that in its entirety and be published from the 1st to the 3rd of March. However, if the SUP YRC is valid for a longer period, so covering a period up to a month, then the trigger note term will only be available or issued covering the first 14 days. Um, trigger note terms are obviously issued for specific locations outlined within the, the SUPS and ARCs and where possible may actually cover multiple individual locations. If this is the case, uh, we would generally issue separate trigger note terms uh, for, all, for each location to ensure that all the information is covered and readily available for, for pilots. Just continuing on uh, with the AIP, actually, with ARP SUPS. So if a SUP or ASC covers a large area, uh, for instance, going back to the Talisman Sabre exercise, then an FIR or dual FIR no term will be issued. And finally, if the SUP or ARC is deemed to be more administrative or general in nature, then a head office trigger no term will be issued. Most of you on the call are probably asking why, and it's a it's a it's a question that we get uh, very regularly. Why are trigger no terms only issued uh, for a 14 day period? And the 14 day limitation is an actually an ARCAO recommendation and assists in the reduction of long standing no terms. Um, so it's a bit of a double edged sword. You know, we understand that we want to try to remove the amount of no terms in the system, but then in other situations, pilot want to have those no terms out for a longer period. Now, looking back at trigger no terms. Um, notwithstanding the ICAO requirements, trigger no attempts are meant to raise one's attention to any new document or publication. It isn't supposed to be a no attempt that's out for a long period of time. The, the intent is purely just to raise a pilot's awareness to that document. It's out there for 14 days. And again, if you don't capture that uh, no term in the first 14 days, there is still a requirement as per the AAP. I think Andrew raised the, our awareness to the AAP requirements to jump in uh, to the, the required um, drop down menus and website on the air services uh, platform to, to ensure you've read all your AAP and AAP subs. And again, SUPs, ARPs, ARCs are only available through the Air Services website. Okay. Um, you know, whilst I understand for some of you what we covered today may be somewhat of a refresher on briefing requirements, for others it may be a little more confronting, especially if you're new to flying, uh, when considering the actual amount of information that's available out there. Whatever may be the case, I encourage all of you to take the time to go through the above resources uh, that are readily available, both on the Air Services website and external sites, to support your learning and understanding. There's even a couple of uh, pretty good YouTube videos uh, for those with limited time, and I definitely encourage you all to have have a look. Uh, I believe Craig's also uh, included a couple of those links in, on the chat today uh, that will be packaged up as part of the presentation. And again, from all of us at AIS or the, or, or the Air and Norfolk Information Services team in the NOTAM office, I thank you for taking the time to join the webinar today and hope you walk away from today with the confidence and knowledge to correctly satisfy the requirements uh, of pre-flight briefing and enjoy the time in the sky. Happy flying. Thanks all. Thanks, JP. That was uh, fantastic. Um, and as JP mentioned there, everyone, uh, a lot of information there. So if you found that you might have missed something uh, that you want to go and revisit, just remember this has been recorded and you'll be able to access this presentation from the CASA uh, YouTube page uh, at a later date and go through the bits that you might want to refresh. Uh, a couple of questions from the chat there. Um, a few of them, I'll, I'll, I'll take the first few that revolve around the complexity of NOTAMs. Uh, and there's one from also Ian about the complexity of weather forecasts and why these things can't be written in plain English. I can sort of address both of those. And, and I guess uh, ICAO format is one of the big uh, overriding requirements that we have when we produce or when air services and the Bureau of Meteorology produce things like NOTAMs and, and weather reports. They have to be coded in such a way that they're readable by, you know, pretty much everyone in the aviation industry. 
Now, for pilots that operate every day, reading whether or no TAMs is really a problem because they're used to it. They're practicing it every day. With my time in CASA, talking to a lot of members out there who are general aviation pilots uh, in the private world, typically we don't fly as often. And at some point, we must have demonstrated competency to read the weather and understand the coding as well as the no TAMs. If it's a struggle these days, it's probably due to lack of recency. So what I'd encourage people to do is access those tools that we pointed out on the Bureau of Meteorology website. They've got all the codes for the weather reports, et cetera. Uh, as JP said, there's, there's work in the background of simplifying or reducing the amount of NOTAMs that are there. But certainly getting hold of a flying instructor if you're a bit rusty, getting him to help you run through it, and most importantly, allocating sufficient time in your flight planning to go through the NOTAMs, because in the end, we fly in a very complex environment and it's very difficult to make a simple set of NOTAMs that are going to cover all the aspects that we need to consider for our safe flight planning. So do allocate enough time to go through those NOTAMs uh, in detail so that you don't miss anything that's important. Um, we've got a few questions uh, both before the presentation and in our chat there, JP, if I can direct this one to you. Um, why do we have to change our NAPES password so often? Thanks, Craig, and thanks for the uh, individual that obviously raised that question. Uh, yeah, one that we get uh, very, very frequently, and I believe it was uh, briefly touched on by another uh, a member. It, in in summary, we're all aware that the password requirements every 180 days we need to be reset, uh, and the regular changing of the password protects our air traffic control system from unauthorised intrusion and maintains security from cyber threats. Uh, I think it's probably a timely uh, reminder, especially for everyone that's probably read up or been across the FAA NOTEM database, uh, I guess, hack or cyber threats that they uh, attacked that they had the other week. Um, that's that, that hit home for us. Um, and for those that aren't aware, NAPES, whilst I understand the frustrations with respect to password resets, it's not only used by GA Aviation, it's also used by RPT, um, other agencies uh, that have secure or safety related material embedded uh, in their actual user profiles. So again, um, whilst I understand the frustration with having to reset your password, uh, unfortunately at the moment in the current system, there's not an ability to isolate one's password requirements. So even no term office staff, people that actually work within air services as, a, as, an, as a, a company, all have the same requirements to update their passwords. Thanks, JP. Another uh, question that came up a couple of times in chat there was uh, the amount of acronyms that we're using, which is uh, obviously fairly common in aviation, and where we can decode those. Uh, thanks to Heidi, because uh, she put a reference in the chat for us. If anyone missed it, it's AIP Gen 2.2, so you can get a lot of the abbreviations that we've discussed today from that reference, and there's also some uh, in URSA as well. Yeah, correct. If I can just leverage off that as well, Craig. Uh, currently, or I'm currently uh, in discussions with uh, some RKO working groups, etc., with regards to trying to again um, isolate some commonly used language in no terms uh, understanding that it might be recognized from an international perspective and we have to obviously follow suit but again trying to update that list so it's fit for purpose and um, when taking into consideration uh, that the majority of people obviously operating within australia are our ga community rpt pilots uh, but yes the current reference is that's correct ap gen 2.2 uh, provides the list of all approved domestic international meteorological and no term abbreviations in Australia. Thanks, JP. Uh, one more just from chat before we open it up to anyone who wants to ask one. Uh, Brendan was asking, is there uh, work to visualise the NOTAM areas? Uh, so I assume that's sort of along the lines of the graphical area forecast where they put it on a map to make it easier to understand. Is there any work um, going to do that with NOTAMs for restricted areas, etc.? Very good question, and it's definitely something that's on our radar. For those that aren't aware, uh, NAPES is uh, what, what we, I guess, refer to here is end, end of life. Uh, the NAPES replacement system, uh, we've actually secured funding uh, to be able to look into that. And one of the actual dynamic, uh, I guess, inclusions of that is the ability for graphical displays. So it's definitely on our radar and, and front of mind. And hopefully that system or replacement system can be up and running um, in the not so distant future. Thanks, mate. Okay, well, look, we, we've got a 
time for a few questions now. So if anyone's got any questions they want to ask uh, whilst the group is here, please feel free to stick your hand up now and we'll take those. Peter, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, I've actually just typed the question in, but um, one of our local airfields operated by a local council, so it's an ALA, it does have a Y code. Um, occasionally they close the airfield for other users. There's a drag club uses it and model jets and so on. Um, I've always found they always claim they have issued a NOTAM, but I can never ever find one on NAPES. And the only thing I've ever found is that they, they put a general public notice on their own council website and they're calling this a NOTAM. Is that adequate or is that correct? Or have they got more of an obligation as a operator to actually lodge a proper um, NOTAM through the air services? Craig, did you, are you happy hey, for me to? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely mate, go ahead. Yeah, yeah thanks, Peter. Uh, and very good question. So I think one thing I probably should have clarified with respect to uncertified aerodromes, uh, again, it's not always a requirement to issue a NOTAM, but if the actual individual or the reporting officer at that ALA is advising there are issuing a NOTAM, um, just out of curiosity, uh, in terms of the actual Yankee code, does actually is it assigned a, a Y code for the for the location? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and obviously, can't find anything when trying to retrieve a, a briefing on that uh, Y code. No, I've I've stood there with the you know the people that are running the the events that are for it's closed for, and they're adamant that they've issued a NOTAM. I was there one day, and another pilot dropped in. You know, a it was a student, I think, come from another field, and you sure. know, he, yeah, <laughs> and and they're going, oh, didn't you see the NOTAM? And it's like, well, you you fellas don't really issue a NOTAM on aviation services. It's it's you know, people don't go and read a local council website for a for a um a NOTAM. No, correct. And and going back to, I guess, the slide previously, and again, that table that I displayed will be put into the pre-flight manual, uh, but we wouldn't ne normally issue a NOTAM for a closure of a runway or, or a short-term closure on an uncertified location. Uh, and the reason for that is actually covered in the regulation that when operating to an uncertified strip, it's actually a pilot's responsibility to phone ahead uh, to those locations to ensure that there isn't anything that needs to be notified. In most cases, those uncertified locations will actually opt to both provide that information over the phone if a pilot does call ahead and also include the information on their website. Um, to go on back to the actual, uh, I guess, issuance of a NOTAM, we usually only consider it for a long-term or a permanent closure for an uncertified location and not for a temporary closure of for a, a runway. And the, the other reason for that as well is uh, in accordance with the MOZ uh, 139, uh, for the reporting officer, if they do have a temporary closure of the runway strip, they do still need to abide by uh, some other uh, coordination or stakeholder uh, involvement. So whether or not that's emailing uh, your, your normal operators, putting something up on your website, you know, marking and lighting, coning off the actual runway, putting the big crosses out on the actual end of the runways. There's, there's other mechanisms uh, to be able to, um, I guess, satisfy the obligations to ensure that the safety uh, aspects are mitigated. Yeah, sure. Okay. I mean, it's not it's not a problem for local users because they're usually aware of it. It's more the um, yeah, like I say, training schools that might come from you know two hours away or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the other aspect is, like I said, so not all ALAs or uncertified locations are actually authorised to issue no temps. Um, not to go into too many, too much detail, but we have what's called a, a data product specification that certified originators around the country, especially those certified aerodromes, need to complete, uh, I guess, what's called a DPS uh, to satisfy their requirements that they are, that they know what they're doing with respect to no teaming. And it's not always the case, especially for uncertified locations that might only have a handful of uh, flights uh, a week. Sure. Thanks very much for that question, Peter. That was a good one. Thanks, JP, uh, um, for that information. Uh, Gareth in the chat there uh, mentioned about uh, the terminology of uncertified aerodromes. Did, did we mean verified or unverified? Under the new CSR Part 139, uh, aerodromes now classified as certified under Part 139 or uncertified, and that'll be reflected in their URSA entry. So uh, if you can go and have a look at that, Gareth, that'll explain what that is, uh, and that would be the new terminology that we'd use uh, from this point on. No other hands up at this stage, so 
uh, we will assume that at this point there's no questions. So to finish off, um, firstly, I'd really like to thank our presenters, uh, Wayne Ovens, Andrew Bowmanis and JP Lamilla uh, for their time. Uh, they uh, offered their time and expertise to us, which we really appreciate. And uh, I hope we all got something out of uh, their presentations. Uh, for yourselves, the attendees, I hope you're taking away at least one or two things that you've reflected on and thought, yep, I could be doing that a little bit better and uh, we'll undertake to make that happen. And if we do that, I'm sure all our flying will, will just be that little bit safer in future. Thanks again for attending. Really appreciate your time and uh, I hope to see you at our uh, next event.